Good to see each one this evening. Good number assembled, and we want each one to feel welcome. When we're finished, as announced this morning, we uh, will have a Q&A. Hope you have some questions, and we'll see if we can find some answers. Noah's Ark has been the favorite object of ridicule of atheists for years. I think it's one of the anchors of our faith. I think it explains much of geology. I think it's the foundation and beginning point for our understanding of God. I think we have really good evidence that the flood happened and that the ark just may still be available. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. We can get our graphics to go. The first point that we want to make is that the the flood, the ark, are not fairy tales, not just in the storybooks. This is real. This actually happened. In spite of the the ridicule that you hear from so many. I wish we had time to go into the geological evidence for that. We will be talking ab about some of that evidence uh, this evening and then more through the week. We could very easily spend a week just on the geological evidence. I think it's overwhelming. But we want to focus on the biblical evidence. There are a great many people who claim to be Christians who don't buy the story and ridicule the story. Jesus thought this was a real story, and we see that clearly indicated in Matthew 24, the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. If you don't believe in the flood, the days of Noah, then what does that say about the judgment day? You mythologize one, Jesus says one's just like the other. That just doesn't work, though many, many of our liberal friends don't understand that. Peter thought it was real. Second Peter chapter 3, they deliberately suppress not this myth, but this fact that the world existing at that time was destroyed when it was deluged with water. The word deluge is the word cataclysmo. We get cataclysm from it. This, this was bad. It destroyed the world that then was, Peter said. And it's a fact. And the evidence is so overwhelming that it takes deliberate ignoring of the evidence. And some have no trouble with that. Honest people certainly should have big trouble. The flood was real, but that's really not the only battle we have to fight. Many will say, okay, I, I agree that this, this was real, but it was just a local flood. It didn't involve the whole world. And that's really where, if we're talking about the biblical aspect, we have to emphasize. There are at least 30 universal terms in Genesis in the description of the flood that clearly indicate that it was real when it talks about the water over uh, the mount, all the mountains, every mountain, everywhere. And there's just no way to look at that text and believe it and think it was local. I mean, why would you need an ark if the birds could just fly over the hill? Uh, the, the whole story certainly lends itself then to the mythological interpretation. Genesis 7 said the water prevailed more and more on the earth and most of the mountains. And that's not what it says. It's all of the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. If you've got any faith in the Bible, how would you say it so that it would be more obvious that this covered the globe? We do have flood traditions around the world. Uh, at least 300 accounts from 
that anthropologists have documented in the North American Indians, various tribes, and the Eskimos, from the Aboriginal uh, Australia. I was in the outback and saw one of the boomerangs that the artisan had for sale, and they had the carving of eight people on it. And I asked him about this together with a boat. What's the, well, this is about, and they had a different name for him, but the eight people that were saved from the flood by the boat. Uh, I talked to one of the liberal theologians there in Australia. He said, well, yes, this, this is a myth. And people around the world, they, they know about floods, and they just imagine big floods in the outback in Australia. I don't think they've had a lot of floods there. That's about the worst place to try to imagine where people would think about a flood. 300 accounts around the world. Genesis 7, verse 23, he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the land. Now, that, if you're trying to say it was a complete flood around the globe, I, again, I don't know how you could say it any plainer. Do notice that he's talking about the land. A lot of people, as they object to the story, will talk about, well, there's all of these species, but 70% of the globe is covered by oceans, isn't it? That's where most of the critters live, and ocean critters don't need an ark. They get along just fine in water. Those on the land are what's referred to, and I think when, when they get these lists, magnified, multiplied. They, they count the insects, which usually come out to be about half of the total. I think Mo Noah was probably trying to keep the insects out. <laughs> they only need two of each one, and I don't think they needed to be on the ark. They were log mats and things floating where they could survive just fine in the ocean. Genesis 7 says he blotted out every living thing on the face of the land. Only Noah was left together with those. Well, all the people were there in the Mesopotamian Valley, and uh, it was just this local valley that was flooded. Only Noah. Now, that, that's a, a very poignant statement in the first place. You read Genesis chapter 5, verse 30, and you read of Noah's father who had sons and daughters, including Noah. That says there were sons, there were brothers and sisters of Noah that, that didn't make it on the ark. And then you read verse 32 of the same chapter. After 500 years, he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These were the children of his later years. No children for 500 years, the first 500? I, maybe, but that's doubtful. I think he had sons and daughters and brothers and sisters, and only Noah and these three sons and their wives made it. That's, that's a sad picture. But how many people were there? Could they have all fit in the Mesopotamian Valley? Genesis chapter 6 says the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. That's what it says. Uh, the liberal theologians just don't believe that. When you calculate the flood population, it's, it's rather staggering. We hear a lot about the population bomb and some of the, the liberal calculators really get carried, but here, uh, I think they're dampening the, the evidence for huge amounts of people. I think the population is one of the strongest arguments that people have against the old earth. You, you can measure the rate of population growth, and you just get through the roof, and hundreds of years, that is thousands, certainly, certainly not millions of years. If you take the, the 
population growth rates anything like what we see today and apply 2,500 years, you follow the Septuagint rendition, which I think is more dependable chronology of the Old Testament, just a little different from the Masoretic, but not much. But of course, it works either way. How many people would you have at the time of the flood? Two people to the flood at today's population growth rate. Well, you have to know the population growth rate, and this is the formula. We won't scare you with the math uh, that's involved. You have to assume a rate. Uh, if you look at Sedan, uh, you've got a population growth rate of about 3.8. That's, that's on up there. That's pretty high. In the U.S., it's really taken a nosedive recently. For most of our history, it's been well above one, even two. Just uh, 2020, it was 0.88, and that's dangerously low. That's not going to survive. Actually, it's even less than that, I'm told, for 23. But let's take 0.88 at a population growth rate. And how, applying the formula, how many people would there be on the earth given the years from the creation to the flood? Just 2,500 years, not hundreds of thousands and millions. 2,500 years at this minimal growth rate, we're talking about 8 billion people. Well, that's where we are right now. It, uh, well, what do you do with the hundreds of thousands of years? <laughs> you, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. That's an argument against it. We can look at the staggering growth that takes place, and a population bomb is a pretty good description. These are pretty good historical estimates of the population of the Earth, beginning 500 B.C., uh, it's really taken off. If you put it on a chart, it looks something like this. Do you see a problem with that? Does that look a little strange? Why is it so flat for so long and then takes off? That doesn't look like what we would expect, would it? Well, maybe it's leaving out a destruction in the middle and starting over again. That fits better, doesn't it? If you have a judgment and then you start again, then the charts begin to look more realistic. And then you get to something else that's coming, and it looks like it's about time. Just a scary picture. Genesis chapter 9 says, uh, I set my bow in the cloud because there's going to be lots more floods coming. No, 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 that's not what he said. There's only one. And never again will there be a flood. This was totally unique. And of course, there's never been any local floods. There have been all kinds of local floods. But there never was going to be something like what happened with Noah again, which says this is unique and certainly not a local flood. I think one of the most interesting, I get into geology just a little bit here, as we look at Mount Everest, uh, I think much, much, much taller than it was before the flood. Uh, but we've got seashells up on top. What do seashells do on top of Mount Everest? In fact, the seashells are the very ones that belong at the bottom, according to the geologist. Here's the geologic column that we'll be talking about later in the week. And right at the bottom, you've got the Cambrian and then the Ordovician. What kind of fossils do you have on top? You've got the Cambrian and the Ordovician fossils on top of Mount Everest. And listening to them try to explain that is a comedy. It does not work. Well, maybe the mountain grew under it and pushed it up. Uh, but then where did it come from? There's nothing around there like that 
to be pushed out, well, all the way to North Africa. Well, maybe some big block got pushed from North Africa all the way to Nepal without breaking anything, and then it grew under it. And it gets to be ridiculous. You've got seashells not only on top of Mount Everest, you've got them on mountains all around the world. Many of you perhaps have seen that. Some of your travels, it's not that rare. This is Mount Ararat that we'll be talking about. I've climbed that seven different times and found seashells uh, each time all over the mountain. Here are some that were collected in 2013 at uh, 7,000 feet, well over a mile up. One of the most compelling arguments from the standpoint of geology would be what's called pillar lava. They're in the shape of pillars. They're not soft, but they're hard lava balls. The physics of cooling underwater produces the pillar shape, and they are taken as evidence of subaqueous deposition. As here, even Wikipedia acknowledges, it indicates the extrusion of lava underwater. That's what that means when you find it. And here they are confirming subaqueous volcanism. Now, this is a picture of pillow lava on Mount Ararat. And if you look in your geology textbooks for pillow lava, you won't find a better picture. In fact, I thought about trying to sell this picture to them. It's a better picture than they've got of pillow lava. And especially you look over here at the one that's split, you can see the concentric circles around it. This is just dramatically, obviously, pillow lava that has to form underwater and it's well over a mile up on the mountain. This is two miles up on the mountain, a whole field of pillar lava at 12,000 feet uh, over two miles up. Now, how did that happen? Uh, well, it's interesting to hear them describe it. Briefly, and I have to remind it of my daughter's as they were growing up, time to time, come to me and say, Daddy, briefly, what time is it? So Some people have a hard time doing it briefly. But I'll get close to the geological evidence here. When we look at the, the global extent of layers, local floods, they'll acknowledge, usually create layers that are consistent for a short period. But now then, around the globe, you have some unique layers that are just very obvious, like the Austin Chalk. Now, it was first described at Austin, and Austin is famous uh, in geological circles for the chalk. It's a very unique layer, has very specific critters that live in it, together with black flints, usually with glauconic sands under and above, and so the context and the critters and the black flints all in the particular uh, type of limestone, the chalk, it's, it's easy to recognize. It's unique, and it goes around the globe. Notice the description here from Derek Ager, who at the time this was written was president of the British Geological Association. He says, we need some kind of explanation for this. It goes around the globe, here from Texas all the way to Russia, to the USSR. How do you get a local flood to do that? Um, we work, as we'll see later in the week, at Glen Rose, Texas, where you have the human and dinosaur footprints together. Uh, exactly what you find there, you find in the middle of Arkansas. And it's called the Glen Rose Limestone, which is what it was named in Texas, just near Dallas, with the same critters, the same kind of huge dinosaurs stepping in the tracks. Uh, from Texas to Arkansas, that's not a local flood, is it? 
or certainly the Austin Chalk, or many others that we could document, that are global. I have samples of the Austin Chalk from Austin, from England, from Turkey, from Israel, from Jordan, from Egypt, that I have collected around the world, which is not that hard to do. It was real, and it was global, and there's powerful evidence for both. We're just hitting the high points. I have often lectured with an hour just on the geological evidence. We spent just a few minutes. But when you look at the Bible, when you look at the flood traditions around the world, the seashells on the mountaintops, the pillar lava, which says it was formed underwater two miles up, and the global layers that surround the globe, that says it's real and it's global. And it's not just what the Bible says. It was real. But how in the world do you get all those animals on the ark? You ever heard that? This is the first thing. Yeah, that's just not possible. They've been told that. Bill Nye, the science guy, is famous for his ridicule of what the Bible says. He'll say you need to get a bigger boat because you've got all of these animals. And he refers to this list. I notice that we've got missing there the arthropods. Maybe our switching from one computer to the other has eliminated one of the text fonts. Anyway. That's where the most of them are. Over half of them are insects that we talked about. But here's eh, maybe a million animals. What's the problem with this? Do you need fish on the ark? 70% would be in the ocean, just roughly estimating, since that 70% of the earth is covered with water. Uh, if you eliminate the ocean critters, then you've got a very different picture than what you see here. It looks more like this. And that comes out to maybe 17,000. And that's species, not kinds. When you compare species and kinds, as it's used in Scripture, you see very obviously it's a much broader category than species. More, it's closer to families. 750 families, that's probably a little more than that. We've estimated maybe 1,400. Some have estimated 2,500. But when you look at 5,000 kinds, which is a very generous estimate, times two, then you've got maybe 20,000 regular animals. You add another 1,000 for the clean animals. You've got to have seven each of those. And that's a an exaggeration, you got maybe a total of 21,000. Well, is there any way to get 21,000 animals on the ark? Not if you're looking at the Fisher-Price toys that you play with in the bathtub. That's, that's not going to work. And that's, of course, nothing like what the ark was. Uh, it was more like this well over 500 feet in length. And yes, you see dinosaurs going up the gangplank. I think we can prove they were on the ark. But we're looking at a structure, the height of a five-story building, and the width, 500, over 500 feet long, almost two football fields. We can borrow a and m Stadium here to illustrate. That's what we're talking about when we're looking at the ark. And by the way, the graphic here representing the ark is black. Have you ever seen a picture of a black ark? Why? What color is pitch? That, I'll just throw that in extra. Just think about it. We, we don't do a good job of thinking very often. How many animals could you get on the ark? You've got 2 million cubic feet of space, which really doesn't relate to what we're used to thinking about. 
That's the equivalent of about 750 railroad cars. You ever seen a train with 750 railroad cars? No, you haven't. That's way beyond the world record for the longest train. That's not possible. This would have been over five miles long, the train, 750 cars. But that's the capacity that we have for the ark. And that kind of train can carry a lot of animals, can You got to know the average size animal. And we actually are talking about not, uh, well, the average size is about the size of a cat. If we take the sheep, we can calculate easier. You don't really ship a lot of cats across the country in railroad cars, but you do with sheep, and you've got a handle on how many you can put in the railroad car. They've got a standard in the industry. About 240 sheep per double-deck railroad car. And when you multiply that times 750, you've got 180,000 animals, which would give you a rough idea of the capacity of the ark. But how many did we need? We needed 20,000, not 180. Well, what about the dinosaurs? Uh, they certainly got very big, but I think those were the great grandpas. Um, reptiles continue to grow their whole life, unlike mammals. Uh, the older they are, the bigger they continue to get. And I think some of them live longer, as people did before the flood. The average size, even with that factor involved, is not the huge. There are many chicken size. Uh, but the, the average, we're told here in PLOS, the, one of the standard scientific journals, is about the size of a buffalo. Now, you get 50 pairs of buffalo. You've got plenty of room for that on the ark. And that's about the number of kinds that you have uh, for dinosaurs. So plenty of, of room. And, of course, you wouldn't have to have the adult size. It'd be much better to take the teenagers, the youngsters, that hadn't grown for many, many years um, if you're going to repopulate the earth. It's interesting that the word dinosaur People say, well, well, you don't have any dinosaurs in the Bible. And it's an indication they're not really thinking very well. Uh, the King James was translated in 1611. The word dinosaur was invented in 1841 by Robert Owen. And so you don't have dinosaurs in the King James. And they they talked about dragons, and that's what continued to be described generally into the era where everybody knows there was no such thing as dinosaurs at that time. That is, if you're going to be an atheist, you're not going to believe them. Anyway, you don't expect to find that word, but you do find dragons. And what do dragons look like? All the way through the Bible, dozens of times, and throughout history, and most societies will have dragons they talk about. Yes, I, and we find geological evidence for that. That's another lecture. We'll get to some of it. So when we understand kinds is not species, when we double for extinction, and we did allow for things going downhill, okay, let's double the size. But double the average size from a cat to a sheep. We still get a hundred and um, we get twenty one thousand animals, and we only needed or we had room for a hundred and eighty. Well, where's the problem? That's obviously not a problem at all. That's about twelve percent of the capacity. So you could have all of the animals on the first floor. You could have the food up on the second floor and just drop it down to them and have the third floor for Mr. and Ms. Noah and family up on the top. 
In fact, you could have room up on the top for a regulation-sized football field and still have room for all the animals up to watch on the top floor. Well, where's the problem? We're the ones that need to be doing the ridiculing rather than cringing when they say, you can't get all those animals in there. Well, have you put the pencil to it? Have you figured, well, how big was the ark? I don't know. And how many animals? I'm not sure. And, but they know you couldn't do that because they've been told it. The atheists need to be ridiculed. If you want answers to the objections that typically are made, I'd recommend a book by John Widmerappy talking about the feasibility of Noah's Ark. John's a friend, uh, not uh, a very social animal. But he spends a lot of time in the library. and He's researched every argument atheists have made for the past hundred years and provided an answer. This book has a lot more information than you'd ever want to know. But if you find the argument, you'll find the answer in this book. It's not really that difficult. Which brings us to another question. And understand, this is not the same question. Totally different question. Could it still be there? Wouldn't have to still be there in order to be a real story. But if it is, that pretty well settles the first question, doesn't it? Uh, I think there's very interesting and compelling evidence. Notice the statement by Gilbert Grosner as we think about the implications. He said now, he, is, he was the first editor of National Geographic, who has a very different viewpoint than the present editors. The discovery of Noah's Ark would be the greatest archaeological find in human history, the greatest event since the resurrection of Christ. It would alter all the currents of scientific thought. And if we think of the implications, it's rather staggering. Not only answering the skeptics, the, the liberal theologians, religion has to start over, the, the liberal religion. Geology talks about millions of years and gradually developing. No, no, it started over at Mount Ararat not that long ago, 4,500 years ago. That's, that's a very different picture. Zoology, biology, you, you got to throw all the books away and start over because evolution is not the explanation. It's God's creative hand that's demonstrated. And this would be a demonstration of that. Uh, trying to get your mind around the implications in our society, if that were consistently applied, is truly staggering. Of course, people are making claims, and you've heard, here's the tabloid saying Noah's Ark found on Mars, uh, found in Iran under Saddam's palace. People that, and that's kind of encouraged because it ridicules the idea that there may be reality there. As we think about that, this is a cover from a book that was written about some of the possibility, a pretty good book. And again, we see the problem. That's a brown arc with planking that you can see. If it were covered with pitch, it wouldn't look like that, would it? But can wood last 4,500 years? I've been told by biologists, I know that that's not possible. Well, there haven't been to many museum, archaeological museums where you find all kinds of things that are older than that. Here's an article from Nature talking about noodles from China, 4,000 years old, art covered with pitch. Uh, I think would be a little more substantial than Chinese noodles. Here's a boat that was buried near Cheops, the great pyramid in Egypt. Uh, about the time, it's dated to 4,500 years. I don't think it's quite that old, but close. And uh, it's in great shape. It's wooden, and a lot of it is held together with ropes. And the ropes are in great shape. What's the problem here? Uh, it's okay here, it's not okay there, it doesn't work. Uh, we're told it was made of gopher wood. 
what in the world is that? Well, it's covered with pitch. I think maybe closer to resin. And it would look more like that. And you can see the scale maybe a little better in this representation. Uh, one of the problems in trying to find it and locating it on the mountain is this is the way the mountain looks 11 months out of the year. It's going to be hard to find a boat covered up with the snow, isn't it? One month out of the year, it looks more like this. It's covered with pitch against black volcanic rock. It doesn't exactly jump out at you, does it? That's a challenge. But what in the world is gopher wood? You want to hear the answer, the definitive answer. We don't know. That's, that's the only real answer. But there's some interesting possibilities and uh, maybe even probabilities from some of the ancient manuscripts and several other lines of evidence. I think it's laminated wood. I don't think it's a species of wood. It's like plywood. You don't go looking for a ply tree. <laughs> this is a type of construction. And we do have laminated beams with arches that would cover exactly what we're talking about with the ark. Here from Wikipedia, not a dependable source, but even they understand, as they're talking about laminated wood, uh, it's stronger than steel for weight, uh, greater strength and stiffness. Uh, it's do have spans more than 500 feet, which is the size of the ark. Uh, it uh, carries heavier loads. Uh, it's easier to use, and it's waterproof. That sounds like a pretty good idea if you're going to build an ark. Listen, it's lighter, and it's stronger, and it's waterproof, and certainly more durable than noodles. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. One of the challenges uh, is the political circumstances that surround the area of Mount Ararat. And I think the description in Scripture is, uh, if not absolutely definitive, very strongly implies that it is the mountains of Ararat. Some people say, well, that, that's a range, and so you can't tell. It is not a range. People say that, don't know what they're talking about. There are two mountains. One is small, the other is big. The small one is not a candidate, easy to navigate. There's one then that stands out as a possibility. But look at the context here, the political problems. You've got Iran about six kilometers in this direction. Uh, to the north, you've got Armenia. To the south, you've got Iraq and Syria. And eastern Turkey is a war zone. They've been at war with the Kurds for the past 30 years. In the middle of a war zone up against Iran and Iraq and Syria is not a really nice place in the world, and it's, it's a, a challenge. Right there is where the mountain is. Uh, the Kurds have been at war with the Turks. They've killed over 30,000 in the past 30 years. Uh, numbers range up to 40. Uh, I'm standing here with my back to the border of Iran. Uh, and then just across the border in Iran, you look back, there's the mountain shows you how close it is to Iran. If you go to the north in Irvan, the capital of Armenia, there's the mountain. You can see it from there, the former Soviet uh, area. Uh, we do find archaeological evidence from ancient writings. Pilgrims that visited the Ark, Rostas, the Babylonian high priest, wrote of those who did in his time. We, Josephus mentions at least six historians 
who had talked to people who had been there. And so at least in the first century, it seems that wasn't an issue. From Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, uh, all uh, of the writers of barbarian histories make mention of the flood and of the ark. Now, if you're not Jewish, you're barbarian. <laughs> but all of them, he says, and he lists specifically six, make mention of this. Uh, he says the land supposedly, uh, or the land possesses the remains of the ark, which uh, to this day can be seen to those who... And so it was a historical reality in the first century. It did seem to disappear in terms of histories uh, in the next few hundred years. I think the ice built up, covered it. Uh, it returned historically in 1840 when a huge earthquake cut a big gash in the side of the mountain, shook a lot of the ice off. And from that point, we've got about 25 eyewitness accounts that appear to be very credible, four in particular. This is Georgia Hagopian, who lived at the base of the mountain, one of the Armenians who fled the extermination of many of the, uh, the Armenians, possibly three million killed. The Russians say the Turks did it. Turks say the Russians did it. <laughs> it got done and he fled to America. This was his description of what he saw. He climbed up the mountain with his uncle in uh, the early 1900s, 1905, 1911. And um, at that time, at the end of the summer, it was visible, and this is what he said it looked like. Um, now, it doesn't look like a ship. It's not designed to go anywhere. It has one window all the way across the top. I'd always wondered about that, and especially the King James rendition finished a cubit and a half upward. What does that mean? Well, there it is. It's kind of like a baffle across the top that would keep the water out and allow the air in. Looking at another angle, this was produced by a commercial artist, Alfred Lee, who worked with our, uh, Georgie uh, Agopian drawing that picture. He drew that picture, and then we have this picture by a Russian who was a part of a 50-member team dispatched by the Tsar to go up the mountain to investigate a sighting from Russian aviators at about that time, maybe a little later, uh, uh, actually 1914, while they were up on the mountain, staying there several months, the Bolshevik Revolution took place. The Tsar was killed. Most of the clerics in Russia were killed. And they come down the mountain with pictures and drawings, descriptions of the ark. He had to flee, and he describes the, the terrible circumstances. Uh, came to Oklahoma City, going the wrong direction here. Uh, we talked to his cousin who had a picture, but he was afraid the people on the mountain would come after him. They had threatened him. Uh, he was a very promising young man. <laughs> we didn't get what he promised. George Green was a petroleum geologist who flew over the mountain in the 50s, early 50s, tracing petroleum uh, uh, layers, and really not religious, not looking for the ark, but had pictures from a helicopter and showed it to some of his friends back in Flagstaff, Arizona. They said, where is this? And he said, that's Mount Ararat. And they said, well, look, there's, there's a picture of the ark. He then went to South America where he was murdered. Um, the Muslims have as a part of their faith the instructions to keep the sight of the ark uh, free from the eyes of the infidel. And if it's pure from the eyes of the infidel, that's where Muhammad is supposed to return. 
And so if somebody gets close to it, they're in serious trouble. And we have talked with those people and about that conviction and convinced them that it would be better for them. I mean, what you know, tourist attraction, anybody here would like to go see it, go in it, be a part of it? I think everybody, certainly a lot of people would. It would be a boom financially. And there we convinced them. Uh, can't talk a whole lot about some of that uh, effort, but I think we have solved the problem that had been a problem. Ed, da <clears throat> excuse me, Ed Davis was there at the end of World War II as one of the army, uh, part of the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, he saved the life of one of the Kurdish village chieftain's grandsons. And as an act of gratitude, they carried him up at the end of the summer to show him the ark. Now, these are three very entry, uh, four very interesting stories, but you look at the picture that they drew, and it looks like they're drawing the same thing. Uh, down at the lower right, Ed Davis shows one that had been broken in two, but he could see into it. Storm came up as he approached and could not get closer than about 50 yards, but with his army field glasses could see this picture. Uh, we have interviewed him at length. He has taken three polygraph tests, passed all of them with flying colors. Uh, this is Don Shockey on the right, who's climbed the mountain five times, and is very aware of the terrain, would say, all right, here's what you're describing. Here in, in the picture, you recognize this. Tell me what's over here. And he could do that, not in the picture, but off the picture. He was there, and we have established that. Uh, credible witness. He, together with Alfred Lee, drew this picture, the two pieces that were broken. Uh, he did pass away in 2002, I believe. This is a, a more modern, up-to-date painting of the drawing that was made firsthand from someone who was there. I've traveled there and climbed the mountain seven times. The main body of the ark is under the glacier on the top, permanent ice cap. We have determined that there is a 100-foot section that has broken off, slid down, that is not under the ice, that's available. There's a con man there who's claimed that he has found the ark and made a lot of money selling videos to the Chinese. He bribed the Minister of Commerce a quarter of a million dollars, was admitted by the Minister of Commerce, to keep me out. And so as a result of that, I'm a terrorist and can't last three times that resulted in my going to jail last August. We think we've got that resolved and uh, we plan to go again this August. And we'd appreciate your prayers. But we know where a 100-foot section is that's not under the ice, about right that section. That's three and a half miles up. That's easy to say. Three and a half miles, straight up. Uh, that's not an easy climb. It follows this route. Uh, this is at 14,000 feet campsite. All of those rocks have tumbled down and continue to tumble down while you're sleeping in your tent at night. Uh, not a comfy campsite, uh, but that's where we rest for a day or two and then travel on up over the top. And I'm having trouble getting this to advance. Once you get up on the glacier, you have new problems. Uh, rocks tumbling down, loose, unconsolidated. Uh, until you get on the glacier, which then eliminates that problem, but then you have the crevasse that is extremely dangerous. The drawing on the right shows it may be invisible at the top, 
you fall through, that's certain death at the bottom with the freezing water. Uh, and that happens from time to time. Here you see the glacier up ahead. You don't see the glacier in the foreground, or at least our lead climber didn't see it. We were fortunately roped together, and he went through that hole, uh, tied together, and uh, he was he did have presence of mind to take pictures while he was hanging on the rope down in the glacier, <laughs> which is kind of pretty. Uh, but <laughs> it's not a safe trip. On up toward the top, 17,000 feet, is considerably higher than anything in the contiguous U.S., about 14.4. Uh, this is me on the top. Uh, that wasn't the goal. It's kind of neat to get there. And you see the storms. You talk about a storm coming up. You look down and you can see the storm. Here it comes up. Uh, it's a literal description. 17,000. The first night we got to the campsite, we had 80 mile per hour winds. <sighs> That's not the place to be in a tent when it's 20 below outside at 17,000 feet. Uh, this was Dr. Randall Price's tent the next morning. Uh, and that looks pretty bad, but actually, that's a big help. <laughs> she was from the wind, and it's much more comfortable once it gets covered with ice. The next night it got bad. Uh, the wind gauge broke at 100 miles per hour, and the tents, many of them were shredded, and uh, that's not good. This was the Dick Bright's tent. He's climbed the mountain 36 times. He's the one that'll be going with me this fall. and. Uh, he was in the third stage of hypothermia when we found him and drug him back into my tent. I did have an extra sleeping bag, and I was told that I should have climbed in the bag with him because he was really in dangerous condition. I said, no, Dick's just going to have to die. <laughs> Not going to do it that way. Uh, at that point, I'm shortening the story. We dug a hole eight by eight, 34 feet deep down to what we thought would be the ark. Spoofing is one of the processes of war in that area. It involves altering the GPS signals. So it's kind of like uh, when you see things out on the desert, mirage. What you're seeing is real, but it's not where you're seeing. And likewise, when you alter the GPS signals, we missed the target by about 20 yards. We could determine that from the Turkey satellite, which was not geosynchronous. And when it goes over and moves across the sky, it reads from several different angles and better at locating. So we then, after digging a very disappointing hole, used augers to drill down to the spot where the Turkish satellite had indicated, and we found wood at 34 feet down in basically an ice cube. Uh, I took the piece down to the hospital at the base of the mountain. Uh, what is this? Can you tell? Well, would you like to see what we saw? through the microscope. Uh, I believe I know what that is. That was wood. So I radioed back. I wasn't going to climb the mountain again. They're already up there. So drill more, get more samples, which they did. They filled a fruit jar with snow and ice. They were supposed to have wrapped it <laughs> with tin wall. Uh, language barrier, maybe they didn't think it was important. Anyway, it didn't happen. They just stuffed it in a fruit jar and brought the samples home, that is, down the mountain. And of course it melted, and you've got the samples floating in muddy water, 
contaminated, but what we've got is pieces of wood with tar with pitch on it. Uh, that's what you're looking at. You see a few of those samples out in the foyer. That's down under the ice. At that point, we were contacted by some people we're not supposed to talk about that are at war in the war zone, and they have agreed to take us to this piece that has slid down. Wouldn't it be easier just instead of digging down through the ice to just walk up to it? I thought, well, duh. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. Uh, <clears throat> there's much more to that story, but you're not going to get to hear that. tonight. It, it, the culmination is that they're taking us to the ark in August, if we can get through passport control in Istanbul. Last August, we weren't able to do that. We went to jail and were deported. We think we've got that solved. We appreciate your prayers. One of the individuals who has since been killed because of his help with us uh, saw the site, and this is the drawing, the eyewitness account. Uh, you see the end of the ark here. You see the little soldiers down at the bottom. Those are soldiers not on the Turkish side, <laughs> the other side of the battle, another one over here. That's exactly the dimensions that we see described in Scripture with the boulders behind it. I think I know what we're looking at, and we know where this is, and uh, we will appreciate your prayers for our efforts. We did have to spend some time in the Turkish jail last August. It's not terrible, but we were there with some other terrorists uh, accused of terrorism. I don't know why they would think I was a terrorist. A picture from our work in Israel. Uh, think with me about some of the implications of this find. In the first place, there's no such thing as a three and a half mile high local flood. Can we agree on that? That's not going to work. If you got it three miles up, you got a universal flood. If you've got a universal flood, you've got that which would lay down horizontal layers with billions of dead things in it in a flood. That's what we see. Well, no, that's gradual evolution over millions of years. No, it's a catastrophic judgment that happened in a year's time. Two different ideas. One fits the geology, and certainly if we've got an arc of this size at three and a half miles up, that ball game is over, and we win and they lose, and it makes a huge difference. So we would appreciate your prayers. It certainly proves worldwide supernatural judgment. We've got the world continents covered with an average of a mile and a half sedimentary water-laid rock. I think that's a flood deposit. They say, no, it was gradual evolution. We say, no, it was a catastrophic flood. We've been contesting that for a good while. I think we've won the battle, but they haven't admitted it. I think this would be the last blow. They, of course, ridicule, just as was the case in the days of Noah. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, Noah condemned the world, and they ridiculed and refused and mocked. And that's exactly what's happening now. As Jesus said, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, along with Noah's other sons, and daughters, and brothers, and sisters, and the rest of the world. God wouldn't do that. God did that. That's a pretty good... <laughs> if you got the flood around the world, then... Uh, 
that's a pretty good answer to this. No, he wouldn't do it. Well, he said he did, and then here's the proof. Uh, just as it happened in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man, when the judgment is coming. It's interesting to notice one more point before we conclude. The, the point, of course, is you do what God says or else, and the or else is serious. It was and it will be. Peter says the day of the Lord will come. Heavens will pass away, earth will be destroyed, burned up. That judgment day is coming, just like it came in the days of Noah. And we need to be ready for that. We also know that it's a picture of God's grace. First Peter chapter 3, we're told that this is like baptism, which saves us. And if you have not been baptized into Christ, this, this is all a part of the picture that goes back to creation and the flood and the judgment and the warning of judgment to come. God's grace is offered, but it's offered to those who obey Him. If you're subject to His invitation, 